and we proceed uh, with Iliana Haganu Opatz from Hamburg. She is by training biochemist and biologist from the U University of uh, Bucharest, and uh, she did her PhD in Düsseldorf, postdoc in Mainz and Marseille. I think a, a nice combination of two yeah. cities. <laughs> and since 2016, she is now professor, full professor in Hamburg. So, Iliana, it's my pleasure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Patrick. Um, I'd like also to um, thank the organizers, Josik and Guri, for putting together this beautiful symposium, for inviting me. And it's also a big pleasure to be an international partner of this consortium because um, I'm the coordinator of a sister program in Germany that it's dedicated also to uh, bringing together uh, neuroscience, uh, neurophysiology, especially with engineering, but also with computational neuroscience. And this is a priority program that uh, is running since almost six years now in Germany and includes several universities. More than that, I think um, the neurophysiological hemisphere, um, as announced uh, previously on one of the speakers, that will um, focus on uh, physiology. And um, um, I would like to thank that, uh, I would like to, uh, to um, specify that um, it is a pleasure for me to be here, but it's also um, a little bit sad because um, many of the issues that I will present to you today resulted from a very fruitful discussion that I had at the last meeting here with Howard Eichenbaum. And unfortunately, Howard passed away last year, so he will not have the opportunity to, um, to see the answer to the question that he asked. But these questions were um, extremely important aspects that um, yeah, somehow directed our work in the last two years. Well, what my group is doing, we are focused on development. So we are investigating the development of neural networks. And a matter of fact, we, we, are, we are particularly interested on the communication with this, within this developing neural networks. Well, communication can be done in the brain by several means. And I think one of the most efficient way is by synchrony. Well, now, synchrony, again, um, you can imagine in, in different ways, and I think there are uh, real experts in this room, but when you um, think about what's going on, you can put it in a, in a following way. Now, imagine that each um, uh, of this metronome, it's one neuron, and um, they, um, they move in a random way. And um, now, I hope that you can hear the result of this random movement. It's a matter of fact, um, nothing. So there is, uh, if you will insert now into the brain um, an electrode, what you will get will be a similar situation. So the random firing of neurons will lead in the extracellular space to no typical response. But now just by magic hands, these metronomes will start to move in the same direction or in the same time. And the result, you will hear it at the end of the movie, it's also quite impressive because it generates a rhythm. And now if you translate this metaphor to the brain, what you will end up is with a typical brain rhythms that have been investigated by many, many experts, some of them sitting in the audience or are not even there to, to address this, this topic. But um, these brain rhythms have been considered to be a very efficient way um, of, uh, of coding into the brain. So now I promise you the result, and you can hear it. The rhythm starts to regenerate. OK, so um, brain rhythms, um, we know that they are present in the adult brain. We heard about this also in the previous talk. Um, but what's going on with uh, development? I mean, this aspect of brain um, uh, function or of the role of this uh, brain rhythm during development has been largely factored out. And this is a question that my group start, uh, or started several years to, to, look, to address. And we are interested on several aspects. First of all, when these brain rhythms emerge, how are they generated? And the most important question is, what is their function for the later um, abilities of the brain? 
Well, the first question is easy to answer. Uh, brain rhythm emerged very early and have been recorded in all mammalian species, including in humans. And I will show you as an example a movie that has been uh, performed in collaboration with my colleagues from Marseille and Paris in the neonatology. What you will see in this movie, it's a, it's a baby sitting in the incubator. It's a healthy, premature kid. Uh, as big as my hand, gestational week 24, 25. It is recorded by EEG, and this is the hand of the nurse that you can see here. And when the EEG patterns in this kid have been recorded, what it's characteristic, it's a different aspect of the EEG when compared to adults. Everybody knows EEG traces in adults, there are, they are always rhythm going on with different frequency, with different relevance. Now, in kids at this age, the brain rhythms are discontinuous, meaning that periods of, I hope the movie works, yes, uh, periods of absolutely silent alternates with the oscillatory discharge. Here's silence, you can see these oscillations that are spontaneous, or they can be induced by stimulation. In this case, it's a tactile stimulation, but they look similar if the stimulation is a light stimulation, auditory stimulation. The French parents were, um, were very supportive in this direction. They, they ask us to stimulate the basis with different, different kind of stimuli. Well, the problem with kids at this age, of course, is that you have no chance to address it to other questions, what are the mechanisms behind these rhythms and what is the role of this rhythm in the brain. So we were, um, um, we were forced to move to, um, um, to other uh, um, mammals and investigate these brain rhythms. And we were very lucky because uh, most common lab animals, the rats and the mice, are so-called altricial species, meaning that they are born at a very immature stage of brain development. And now if you compare the stage of this, uh, this second uh, and third gestational trimester with a brain stage in rodents, this corresponds to the first and second postnatal week in a rat or a mouse. And if now we record these brain rhythms and look at them, they are also discontinuous. And if you look at a um, larger scale at one of these discharges, this is human, this is rodent, you can see that they look very similar. It is a fluctuation, so this is um, oscillatory fluctuations, switching between different frequency bands ranging from slow rhythm theta 4 to 6 hertz until gamma oscillations of 30 to 100 hertz and even higher. So the question that we uh, wanted to, uh, to address was what, it's, what are the mechanisms for this brain rhythm, what is their role, and we have focused in the last years on um, the cognitive abilities um, and the question that we address is whether this early oscillatory activity contributes to the maturation of cognitive abilities. Now, cognitive ability is a big word um, and involves a very, very complex network. And a matter of fact, what we did was to start with the core of the network, that it's a prelimbic or prefrontal hippocampal network. And um, we recorded the activity in these two areas. And all the data that I present to you today are in vivo data recorded from what we call neonatal rodents. This means that they are during the first and the beginning of the second postnatal week, so the same stage of brain development as the babies that I introduced at the beginning of my talk. And um, most of so all this, um, this data, as I said, were performed with uh, silicon probes having different number of electrodes, different configuration depending on the kind of experiment that we performed. But what we observed when we recorded the activity in these two areas, it was also discontinuous, so this was nothing new. It was what I presented to you uh, uh, before, so spindle bursts have been recorded with different, with this fluctuating frequency. But then we performed um, some analysis with this oscillatory activity. We look at the synchrony between the two areas. We look at the directed interactions between these two areas using some mathematical algorithm. And the result that we obtained was already at neonatal age, the hippocampal theta burst have the role to drive the entrainment of local circuits in the prefrontal cortex, especially in the prelimbic part of the prefrontal cortex. And this is a to cut a long story short, the data are published. Then we ask ourselves, well, are these early interactions relevant for the later behavior? Because 
Um, we are talking here about an age where the animal is doing nothing. I mean, you cannot investigate cognition in these animals. If, you put, if I will put them on the table, it will be on, on this table when I finish my talk. So even their motor abilities are very limited. Uh, they are blind, they are deaf. So um, it's, it's, um, the question is, of course, very, very, very uh, obvious. Um, is this interaction relevant for the, for the later cognitive behavior? And for addressing this, what we did was um, to abolish the coupling between hippocampus and prefrontal cortex by different means, cutting some, some of them very rude, like cutting the connections or uh, pharmacological blockade. And um, the result um, was monitored in the behavior of animals starting with juvenile age, when they start to have a behavior, a cognitive behavior. And we did several cognitive tasks, but um, the most simple one that we uh, will look at was the recognition memory. This is something for which the animals need no training and um, no deprivation, so it's a very convenient task. So they just recognize new object or the position of, or new position of an object, and they do this gladly, so without any kind of constraints. And like kids, I always said, they are much more fascinated by the new object than the familiar one, as you can see here on the track of the animal um, uh, that when we monitor. Now, when we interrupted or we diminished the coupling between hippocampus and prefrontal cortex, um, the animals were not able to recognize the novelty. And they had a similar impairment in other cognitive tasks that they, were, that they, uh, that they um, uh, performed. What was interesting was that at the same time in the lab, we have a different set of animals that we investigated for a different project, and we obtained the same result. So we were just wondering a bit, because this was, these were normal mice, no genetically modified mice, but just with an abnormal coupling between prefrontal cortex and hippocampus. Now the question arises, what are the other type of mice that had the same behavior? Well, these mice, were what we call the dual hit genetic environmental GE mice. This is um, a complex definition for a mouse that's supposed to mimic the etiology of mental illness. Now, of course, these mice are not mentally impaired in terms of, of disease like schizophrenia or bipolar disorder, but they just mimic the abnormal genetical background, for example, by having this disrupted in schizophrenia 1 gene or DF16 genes mutated plus an environmental stressor that can be very various too, but in this case it was a viral infection of the mother, or the maternal immune activation in the mother. And they, so they are considered to be somehow um, a model, if you want, um, of, uh, of psychiatric disorders, because also in psychiatric disorders is dual etiology, so abnormal genetic background plus um, uh, uh, stressors from the environment during a specific um, uh, developmental period um, have been described. So then, of course, a question that arises was whether the cognitive deficits that have been largely reported in these mice are a matter of fact the result of an abnormal coupling between hippocampus and prefrontal cortex during early development. That is, of course, the reason why at later stages the network is impaired. And we address this, and indeed this was the case. You remember what I showed you before, the drive from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex. Now in this mice that mimic uh, the etiology of disease, the drive is substantially diminished. On the other hand, when the animals um, are older, at juvenile age, so three, four weeks of age, the drive is strongly increased. It's like an overcompensation. So the network tries desperately to get enough input, but then it overcompensates. So the drive starts to be stronger than it's supposed to be. So we concluded that this um, dysfunction that emerges might be the result of a switch from a neonatal shortage to a juvenile surge within prefrontal hippocampal networks. Well, but all this is is network activity and um, as Patrick already mentioned, so I'm by training a cellular physiologist and in the end for me what's the most important unit, it's still the neuron and the cell. And all these interactions and all this uh, relationship that we, um, that we identified were at network level, extracellular recordings. We had also single unit activity, but again, it was not the cell. We had no idea about the identity of the cells. So the question that in the last years we addressed was to which are the cellular elements that underlie this communication, the normal one as well as the abnormal one. 
And to get an idea of the cellular elements, we thought, well, we should use what everybody's using today, nowadays, so optogenetics. And this is um, something that has been published in many journals and celebrated as a, a technique of the future. And we thought that it's very easy because everybody's doing this. Um, yes, unfortunately, we forgot one important aspect, that this was a fact that our animals are very, very small and very, very young. And these um, two disadvantages uh, turn out to uh, make impossible the usage of any kind of vectors or um, normal, um, let's say, light-sensitive proteins that have been used for the adult animals. And for reason of time, I will not go into details, but uh, we can discuss uh, what exactly is necessary to be done um, to have optogenetics in neonatal animals that looks like that. So um, these are our animals. They are as big as this, and we record them also in heads, uh, fixed, um, um, head fixed as well as um, um, uh, in, uh, in, let's say, uh, freely moving, it's a wrong word, but, well, not fixed state. <laughs> um, and um, so what we are interested when using optogenetics was to target specifically neural populations in the prefrontal cortex and in the hippocampus to identify the interactions between these two areas, now at cellular level. So what we did was to target cell type, layer, and area specific, the neurons in the prefrontal cortex as well as in the hippocampus. And this is how it looks like, first of all, for the prefrontal cortex. This is a, um, a targeting of layer to three pyramidal neurons. You can see that they are all neurons. They are all of them concanized positive, meaning that they are pyramidal cells, and they are all of them GABA negative, meaning that none of them was an interneuron. And now, we had a tool to specifically address these neurons to identify what is their role for the generation of brain rhythm. And what we, what we did was to illuminate these neurons. We used different kinds of, of illumination protocols. What I show is a ramp illumination, so increasing light power. And what you can see here, every single dot, it's a, it's a one spike, and neurons are aligned one to the other. And you can see that they all fire when the light, was, when, when light is shined on. And when we look now at the type of firing, we observe that there is the light induces a preferred fire in the control animals that peaks around 16 hertz, so it's in the beta frequency range, indicating that these neurons, layer to three, are relevant for the generation of beta oscillations in the neonatal prelimbic cortex. To our big surprise, this tendency or this pref uh, firing preference was gone in the animals, in the dual HGE animals. So apparently they have indeed a dysfunction within the local circuit um, of the prelimbic area. And of course, when you look at the network, this was the result that we expected. When we stimulate, we can induce in the control animals activity in beta and gamma range, but we cannot induce this kind of activity in the dual HGE animals. What is now the structural uh, basis of this dysfunction? We look then more carefully at the um, anatomy of these neurons, and we observe that the control neurons have the normal arborization and the normal spines, as you can see here, but the GE animals, say, are almost without, like, they, lack, uh, uh, they have a lack of spines, and their morphology is substantially, or the dendritic arborization is substantially decreased. Now, of course, in this kind of experiments, it's, a very, it's, it's nice to have such result, but it's always a question, can we rescue this? And we were, were a little bit puzzled how to rescue this kind of, of effect. And then um, I hired one PhD student that was crazy enough to come up with an idea um, that we never addressed before in the lab. He's sitting here in the audience, and he's a glia fan. Mattia Kini um, uh, mentioned, wh what about the glias? If the neurons look like that, what about the glia? And I said, we, we, we don't talk about glia here. We are talking about neurons, yeah? So we are interested in firing patterns. But he said, let, let me try. And I said, okay, you have two weeks. It's not so expensive. Come on, do it. And it turned out to be exactly uh, one of the one of the phenomena that we we uh, factor it out, and it was a fact that in the GE animals, the glial cells, the microglia, were hyperactive, 
And um, this is a control uh, glial cell stain, and this is a, um, uh, for the GE animals, you can see the, the hyperactivity. And of course, the hyperactivity of the glial cells can be rescued by using minocyclines and antibiotic, and this has been previously shown. And then we ask ourselves, maybe by, by rescuing this microglia effect, we can also rescue the network and, of course, a, a, a dendritic uh, arborization spines and also um, the firing and the network uh, oscillations. And indeed, this is a case. When we now apply minocycline and we, uh, in these animals, during a specific development, early uh, days, so a few days after birth, and we look now at the uh, morphology, you can see that as the morphology is rescued, though they have the same dendritic arborization as the controls, and even more than that, so oscillatory activity can be rescued. So the beta and gamma oscillations are at the level that they were in the controls and uh, significantly increased when compared with the GE animals. So apparently the structure and function abnormalities in the neonatal PFC um, of this GE mice can be rescued by um, uh, treatment of the glial, uh, treatment of the glial hypermaturity. Well, now the question that um, I wanted to, uh, to address also in the remaining time um, is exactly what Howard Eichenbaum asked me last time when I was in, in Ann Arbor. Um, he asked me, well, you know, this uh, prefrontal hippocampal interactions that you look at, um, it's nice to use all this math um, to show that you have this drive, but did you ever saw this drive? Did you ever saw the C1 neurons push the prefrontal neurons and make them fire? I said no. Um, and this was, um, um, well, a good starting point for the, um, for the experiment that I will show you in a minute. So. I went back to the lab and um, we thought, well, let's try to uh, target the C1 neurons. This one um, in the intermediate and ventral hippocampus because these are the neurons that have been shown to have the, dense, the most dense projection to the prefrontal prelimbic area. And um, we stain them. These are stainings from, uh, from the first postnatal week in, in mice. This is an anterograde staining. We had a retrograde too. You can see here the CA1 neurons in the intermediate hippocampus. Um, the same picture also for the ventral. And you can see these tiny lines. These are the, the projections in the uh, prelimbic cortex. Now, uh, we um, also performed some investigation to see what kind of neurons do they target, the, uh, hippo uh, these axons in the prelimbic cortex. Are the hippocampal axis targeting um, um, pyramidal cells or interneurons? They target both, and they target also um, PV positive and somatostatin positive interneurons. Now, when we look at the connectivity between these two um, areas in the control animals and the dual heat GE mice, or this this, this impaired mice, what we observed is already a significant decrease of connectivity in the GE mice. So apparently the drive from the hippocampus to the prefrontal cortex, I showed you before, it was decreased, but this was drive that we measured by looking at the synchrony directionality. Now we have the anatomy for that. Indeed, there is a substantially decreased projection density in the GE mice when compared to the control mice. And this is true only for the layer 5, 6, because this is a major layer where the projection arrives. What about now, indeed, the driving force, the cellular driving force? What we did now, to, we target the CA1 pyramidal neurons. They are all of them. Uh, um, we use optogenetics for that. We use the neutral electroporation to target the neurons specifically in this area of the intermediate and ventral hippocampus. All the targeted neurons are uh, GABA negative, so they are all uh, pyramidal neurons. And then we activate them. We used again pulsed light, as shown here, or ramp light. And of course, they fire very nicely when we applied light. And what's going on in the prelimbic cortex, when we stimulate in the hippocampus, we got clear oscillations. Every time when we stimulate on the one side, we got oscillatory activity in the prelimbic cortex. So apparently, when we activate by light these cells, we got oscillations. What about now? The type of stimulation that we need for that, we use different uh, pulse stimulation in the hippocampus, and we observe that 
Only when we use 8 hertz, the network can be driven in the prefrontal cortex. With 4 hertz, you can see that there is absolutely flat line, so we induce nothing in the prelimbic cortex, but at 16 hertz, nothing. So it's a very precise tuning of stimulation already at this age when the prelimbic network responds and it's activated um, uh, upon light stimulation in the hippocampus. And now you would ask, what about the dual HGE mice? They have less connectivity, do they respond less? This is exactly the case. This is a response in the network activity. This is frequency dependent, the power in the network of the controls. You can see here the increase in power that is shown also here, 8 hertz stimulation. Dual HGE mice do not respond to this light stimulation. So apparently, not only that they have less projections, but these projections are not functional. And this led us to believe that the activation of CA1 pyramidal neurons led to weaker entrainment of prefrontal circuits in the dual HGE mice. And um, I think this is a, already a proof that indeed the C1 neurons can drive the prelimbic circuits and let them uh, generate local oscillations. And this is summarized on my next slide. So in the control animals, what's going on during early development in prefrontal hippocampal circuits? We have a theta, we have a, um, a projection, axonal projection from CA1 to the deeper layers of um, uh, prelimbic cortex, layer 5-6. This, the theta activity in the hippocampus is, is uh, let's say, relate to the prelimbic cortex and generates here a local entrainment that is clear visible in, uh, in the layer to 3. And this beta low gamma activity requires not only the drive from the hippocampus, but requires also the activation of specific neurons, these are the pyramidal neurons, in layer to 3. We have also preliminary data about the interneurons because, of course, it's, it is not only the pyramidal neurons that, that make all the job, but also the interneurons. And here it's a very nice interplay between somatostatin and PV, but the data are too preliminary to, to be included in our talk. On the, on the other side, on the dual HGE mice, there is a weaker drive from the hippocampus. There is less connectivity, and therefore the theta power that pushes the network to generate activity is weaker. And moreover, there is a synaptic deficit, the less spines that generates, that, that leads to a, to a weaker and disorganized activity in the pr uh, uh, prelimbic prefrontal cortex. Well, so these are the data. And last but not least, I'd like to thank for the general support several funding organizations. Probably the biggest thank to European Research Council because they funded a uh, project with a very provocative title, the PsychoCell. Um, and I'm just wondering whether we will find one or more than one, probably more than one. And I would like to thank also the German, German Research Foundation for, for the support, especially for this priority program, Resolving the Neural Networks. I'd like to thank my group, especially Sebastian Bitzenhofer and Joachim Albert and Matthias Kini that um, um, performed the experiments and obtained the data that I've shown to you today. Well, and I'd like to thank you for your attention, and I would be very glad to answer your questions.